Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Liz Wiley. I'm the Executive Director of the Marion Institute. And on behalf of the board and the Board of Advisors and my team, I just want to welcome you all to uh, our second uh, event in our summer series of our Connector Series. Um, tonight's, you know, we've got this whole series focused on climate change. Um, and so this will continue the, the process a little further along. So these public educational events, what we affectionately call our Connector Series, are a way for us to engage all of you, our constituents, in, in our work. Um, and just to invite you to participate in, in these impactful conversations that we're having. I want to just go a little bit deeper into the Marion Institute and our work, so bear with me for a few minutes while I just explain who we are, because all too often we hear, I know the Marion Institute does good stuff, but I'm not sure what they do. So we want to kind of demystify that a little bit for you tonight. At its core, the Marion Institute is a nonprofit organization, and we're about to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Our, an our mission is to advance a culture of learning and health by empowering individuals, building resilient communities, and advocating for food justice and nutritional security. I hope you've had a chance to browse through our annual report that was on your, on your seat tonight and look at some of the, the work that we do. If you haven't, please bring it home, check it out. Our team is small but mighty, and I think that you'll be very impressed with how much we are doing and, and that we're your local organization right here in your backyard, doing programs globally, nationally, and locally. So I'm going to expand upon to that. Uh, You'll begin to see as you read through our annual report how health, nutrition, and equitable access to clean food and environments threads through all the work and the programs at the Marion Institute. Our biomed program takes an individualized root caused approach to health rather than disease suppression. Our goal with this nationally focused program is to educate individuals and healthcare practitioners about the tenets of, of this modality through workshops, certifications, webinars, and scholarships. On the South Coast, the GROW Education Program offers a hands-on experiential approach to fostering community health that engages students and schools and teachers in a farm-to-school program. Our outdoor garden enrichment curriculum reaches youth, our children and grandchildren, just when they're beginning to independently choose food for themselves and be mindful about what they eat, where their food comes from, and the impact that the food, their food choices have on their bodies. Expanding our scope of work out further, the South Coast Food Policy Council program takes a broader, long-term strategic view of nutrition and community health. Working with our myriad partners and community stakeholders, we advocate for policies and establish initiatives that will build not only a more resilient food system, but an equitable food system for all. Growing out of that work, out of the Food Policy Council work, the Marion Institute is thrilled to announce our newest program. It's called Frogfoot Farm. It's so new that it's not yet listed in our annual report. And Frogfoot Farm is a farm to food initiative. That means that all the food that's grown on the farm will go to food pantries and food relief programs. This partnership, Frogfoot Farm, is made through a partnership with AD Makepeace Company and it's located on the Wareham Plymouth line. The Marion Institute will manage all farm operations on this six acre plot of land, which will include one, growing fresh produce for local food pantries, and two, using the farm as a training ground for a gleaning program. And that might be a term that you're not familiar with, but gleaning is when a farm, another farm in the region has a crop that they're not able to harvest because they either don't have the labor to harvest it or they don't have a market to sell it to. And often that food will go to waste contributing to climate change and all these issues that we're talking about. And it goes to waste when we're struggling daily to feed people that are food insecure. So by tra having a training program, we'll be able to train volunteers that will then go to these farms and be able to rescue that food, and that also will go to food relief. Southeastern Mass has, is home to over 1,500 farms. I think people don't really recognize how much of a farm coast we are. Um, and every year, thousands of pounds of food go to, go to waste. 
Both through our Frogfoot Farm and our gleaning program, we'll be able to increase the amount of fresh local produce being distributed to food pantries. And we estimate that in the next three to five years, we'll be rescuing and growing an additional 200 or more, or more pounds of food annually to go to these programs. This program's coming online at a critical time as we hear weekly, if not daily, from our food relief partners that they are seeing increased numbers in the food pantries and they're running out of food before they have enough to serve everybody. Currently in Massachusetts, one in three Massachusetts residents is food insecure, and that can easily be de defined as meaning that they don't know where their next meal will come from, um, and with children being most impacted. So this is, this is a timely program. We hope you'll see this new program as an opportunity to get involved in our work as volunteers and as supporters and as advocates. And please follow us on social media channels, whichever are your favorite. We have them all. You find yours. Okay, now let me circle back to tonight's topic. It seems we're witnessing climate change impacts daily, from severe weather events infecting crops, infecting supply chains, and economic inflation that contributes to rising costs, costs incurred by our farmers and fisheries. All those costs get passed down to us, the consumers, and I'm sure you're feeling it every time you go grocery shopping. Global climate change is not a future problem. It's here and we're experiencing it now. Last month we learned about climate change and its effects on land from the wonderful Jen Francis. And tonight's focus will be climate change and its impact on the oceans. Uh, to round out this connector series, next month we'll be hosting our annual food summit, which will be held virtually over Zoom. And this year's topic will be food waste and food recovery's impact on climate change. But before I introduce Dave Wiley, I just want to say one thing. Um, after his talk, we'll have, uh, he'll speak for a bit, we'll have a Q&A period, and then we invite you all to stay. We have some local fare and some nibbles, and we'll be opening up the bar. So please take some time to stay, have a bite with us, meet the team. Let me get a little wave from my extraordinary team. Where are you all? They're awesome. You should make time to talk to them all. Okay. Now I get to introduce, introduce Dr. Dave Wiley, who, yes, is my husband. <laughs> Dave is a renowned research ecologist with NOAA's Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. His current research focuses on the interconnected behavior of endangered whales, seabirds, and forage, forage fish sand lance sand lance that play an important role in the ecosystem's food web. Previously, Dave pioneered me methods to successfully rescue stranded whales and dolphins across the globe, and in 2007, his research was instrumental in getting Boston's shipping lanes moved to protect the endangered northern right whale. This first, that's the first change in U.S. history to ever have a shipping lane moved to protect an endangered species, so that was massive. Dave has also worked with fishermen to redesign fishing gear that reduces the risk of whale entanglement and has received numerous awards and recognitions. Currently, he leads research using advanced telemetry and visualization software to explore the underwater behavior of endangered whales and satellite telemetry to understand the movements and foraging ecology of seabirds and sandlands, all of which lead to a greater understanding of climate impacts on the marine environment. So this will be cool. Last month we heard this, like, how the Arctic, you know, weather system was affecting our northern climate, and now we're getting very granular into how it's affecting the species right here in our, in our oceans. Dave's research has appeared in over 50 scientific journals ranging from, ranging from animal behavior to conservation biology and nature. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Switzer Environmental Leadership Award, Gulf of Maine Visionary Award, NextGov, NextGov Bold Award for Scientific Innovation, Massachusetts Audubon Award for Wildlife Conservation, the International, it goes on and on, it really does, Society for Marine Mammalogies Award for Excellence in Scientific <laughs> Communication and a Fulbright uh, Fellowship. Dave, we're so pleased to have you. I welcome you up here. I suspect you're going to want to walk around because you don't like to stand still. Um, so you can grab that, that mic. Thank you all. Thank you, Liz. So it really is a good to be here. Sherry so and so asked me if I was nervous. And I can fight oh, college. Dave, I think we have to turn yours on. There you go. Uh, 
as I said, this is a protagonist face. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I get invited to speak around the world, and I'm not really nervous, except to talk to your wife and make it <laughs> really nervous. <laughs> that, that I'm used to. Used to. Uh, but anyway, it's great to talk about climate change, but I like this first slide that I put together this morning, um, because climate change doesn't sound so bad. I like change. I'm a conservation biologist. I'm an agent. I don't <laughs> Weird, I think, comes a little bit closer um, because the stuff that happens is truly weird. Oh, good, it's bigger. But I really like the climate chaos because what's going on is totally chaotic. Wildfires, droughts, um, erosion, taking houses off of cliffs, and, and sea level rising, all these things are incredibly chaotic. Um, but also, you know, the Chinese symbol for chaos and opportunity are the same thing. So we've got a great opportunity right now to really address climate change. Um, and we really don't have to do it. We just have to have the social and political will um, to follow the dots of the automobile system. So anyway, um, I'm going to go with climate chaos. This is chaos. There we go. Okay, so a little bit of how this topic is going to progress. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change in the ocean. This is not my research. I'm going to show a lot of things that other people have done. So just do that kind of quickly, causes some trends. I'm then going to talk about the cell light and bank National which is where I work, um, because that's going to bring it all home. A lot of the work that I do really is targeted on climate change affecting um, this particular area of cell light and bank National Sanctuary. I'm going to talk, talk about the ecology of the sanctuary, um, how we study it and what we know. And then we're going to take an ecosystem look at the sanctuary, how the changes that we're talking about might um, reveal themselves and what that sanctuary is going to look like in the upcoming uh, century or so. Broader implications of climate change in marine systems. And then finally, how can a healthy ocean actually uh, help uh, climate chaos, climate change, and reduce its impacts? And I think that's really an important thing for us to know. Um, hopefully, you walk away with an understanding that a healthy ocean um, really helps uh, moderate some of the things that we're seeing. We can keep the ocean healthy and make it healthier. I just took a picture from my iPad about all these different things that, uh, in one day about climate change in the news. There's a lot. Um, this is from today. So, again, July is the hottest record of month on record in history. And that's crazy when we start thinking about that. Again, this isn't my research, I'm just pulling things off the internet just to say it's stupid, um, but it does set the table for what I'm going to talk about, which is that the temperatures in the ocean are just going extremely crazy. So, of course, so there you go, down here, 1916, look at how rapidly this goes up, and now it's even more rapid in terms of the increase. Heading off the charts where the ocean surface temperature hit record highs. You know, we're living through an incredibly chaotic time. This is a cool website. If you guys want to look to read this interesting looking around yourself, uh, this is the NOAA website uh, that looks at a bunch of different things relative to climate change, climate chaos. You've got all sorts of maps that show that the world is heating up, the oceans are heating up. Um, you know, this is us right in here. As a matter of fact, oops. I put this together, so sometimes the next slide is going to surprise me. So <laughs> I was thinking there was a different slide to make next. So how does climate change impact the marine system? Well, the most obvious, of course, is global warming. That's the thing we all think about with climate change, global warming. So how does that impact things? Well, increased storm activity, more intense hurricanes, more intense storms in general, um, change in abundance and distribution of marine animals. Uh, we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. Uh, results in sea level rise. So all these things we're seeing you know, right now around us. Ocean acidification, this is sometimes called the evil twin of climate change, when the people don't know about it quite as much as ocean warming. Um, but basically what happens is there's all this carbon being put into the atmosphere. The ocean draws that into the water, and that reduces the pH of the water. Now, a lot of the things in the ocean are calcium carbonate based, um, which means they have shells that are base instead of acidic. And when you bring down the pH from the ocean into a more acidic area, it actually will start dissolving their shells. 
So this is sometimes called the osteoporosis of the sea. And now this is a change in time of things. So a lot of you are familiar with birds. Do you have any bird watchers here? That's a good sign. Yeah. So people are going to talk about birds, that you know the warblers and things in the spring, they arrive up here time for the bud break so that they're able to eat all these little caterpillars and things and bring them to their nests. And if they come at it at the wrong time, those little caterpillars aren't going to be available. That's a change in chronology. So people are worried that the animals and birds will get up here too late. They'll miss those little caterpillars in the sky. So that's an example of this. You'll see some examples of that in the ocean. And then little oxygen levels. Everybody knows that. Um, warm water holds less oxygen than cold water. And so you can have less life in warm water than in cold water. So what does that mean to us? Well, the Gulf of Maine is still I that is warmer and faster than 99.9% of the oceans. So we are at ground zero for ocean warming. So the things that we're doing here um, and seeing here are going to be reverberating around the world, but also we have the opportunity to really be what we call a sentinel site for, for ocean warming or climate change. Okay, a little bit about the sanctuary before I get into it. They were part of the national sanctuary system. These are like national parks, except they're in the ocean. There's a number of them around the country. Uh, ours is right up here. We're the only one up in New England. Right off the coast of Massachusetts here. Then you could see them whale watching, you know, still lying in that. That's where sanctuary is. Whether you're leaving from Provincetown, from Plymouth, from Barnstable, Gloucester, and they're all going to the sanctuary. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, underwater. It's a big sand bank, basically. Um, it's left over from the last glacial period. So the glaciers came down and dumped a bunch of sand here and made this big hill, which we call Still Wagon Bank. You can see this big change in the topography. And this is really the key for the sanctuary. And this is really the key for this entire talk in a way. Uh, because in the ocean, things sink. And all these materials and nutrients sink to the bottom of the ocean and then they just get lost to the system, they just sit there. What happens in an area like this is that those nutrients that have gone down to the bottom, currents hit these big underwater hills and get turned upwards into what are known as uplands. So those nutrients that have been lost to the system sitting on the seafloor are brought to the surface and it's like scattering fertilizer all across the surface of the ocean. The phytoplankton need, the, need those nutrients to grow. So the rock where the sun is, so you bring a lot of nutrients where the sun is, you get these big phytoplankton blooms, which are then eaten by bigger things called zooplankton, so they're eaten by fish, etc., etc. So we get all these things here on Still Lighting Bank because those nutrients are upwell uh, to the surface so they can be more productive. And it's super productive. We're one of the most biodiverse uh, rich areas uh, in the Gulf of Maine along the east coast of the US. So we're going to look at a couple of iconic species of the sanctuary. Um, these are where my research really focused on. Uh, large whales, mostly humpback whales, because they're the most uh, numerous here. We'll talk about seabirds, great shearwaters being the most numerous. Those are these birds that are flying around these humpback whales. We'll talk about some different commercial fish species. And then, as Liz alluded to, we're going to talk about this little guy here. It doesn't look so good in that picture, but he's really only about six inches long, maybe five big round as your thumb. We call it the sandbox. And this fish is what everybody eats. So the shearwaters, the commercial fish, the humpback whales are all eating that one particular fish. So how do you learn about whales? You know, the problem with whales is darn things swim. They don't just swim, but they go down to the bottom. We can't even see them. When I first started out doing whale research, we were really good at being in a boat, and the whale would come to the surface and break down the top. And we would breathe and break down the top. And we'd again and break down the time. And then we'd die and break down the time. And then we'd wait for 10 minutes. <laughs> and we'd help and break down the time again. And that's really all we did. And we took some pictures. Uh, say we could make that an individual that we know. So they really didn't teach us all that much, although we felt pretty good by it at the time. Uh, so now we have to do different things. So these are all different things that we use now to really figure out what whales are doing underwater. It makes us more like terrestrial biologists. So have these poles and these pictures the tag on, you notice they're all suction cups. All the tags we use basically are just a pack of suction cups. 
But it's kind of like, you know, you have those little, you know, games you have with kids with the rubber duck and shoot in the forehead and shoot in the <laughs> Kind of like that, but they don't really afford it. <coughs> so one of the first things you have to do is just get the tag on the balls. So this is how we do that. So the tag is on this tip, this long bowl, and you kind of very carefully, slowly go up and pop them on the back. Not bad. Sometimes it's easier than others. Those animals will be feeding, so they'll be pretty um, pre relaxed. And so our job is to kind of slowly uh, go in towards the else. They really don't mind if you're there. These animals are moving a little bit faster. <coughs> so I'm driving the boat. Uh, I used to actually do the pull work, um, but earlier in my career, I had this great inflatable boat driver who was actually on my wife. <laughs> and she was really good at driving boats. And we had this little 13 foot inflatable boat um, and a little windsurf mask that we used to put the tags on, not these great long. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't know that they got hit. So, uh, so we were doing our tagging with these little, little 15 foot and play old and little windsurf mask holes, and Liz was really good about riding. And so then she took off and went to study killer in the San Juan Islands. And I got all these different people to try to drive the boat um, well washed captains, you know, commercial fishermen, uh, charter boat guys, and you never tag the whale. So I said, man, it's more important the person who drives the boat than the person who actually has the pole. So these days I do all the driving and other people do the tagging. But we have other ways of tagging now that we're just developing. Um, drones, everybody's learning about drones these days. And we say, wow, why aren't we putting tags on the drone? And so I call up some of my friends that are really into <coughs> drones at Ocean Alliance. Uh, it's a male research group up in Gloucester. And they said, yeah, why aren't we doing this for the drone? So we had to go down to Mexico to do it. Uh, to, to study whales, you need a permit in the United States, and they tell you what you can and you can't do. And because nobody ever tagged a whale with a drone, you had to go to Mexico to do it, to prove that we could do it. And we showed very nicely that we could do it. We published the paper you just saw. Um, and so now more and more, um, we're tagging these and these drones, which is really just pretty cool, I have to say. Not as interesting for me, because I don't fly a drone, but I need to try and vote. Uh, but you have to move on. <laughs> so this is the tag. Um, this particular tag is called the D tag. So it'll sit on the back of a whale, and basically it's there like this, and then it'll tell me pitch, roll, and heading about 50 times a second. It also has a hydrophone in it that will record any whale sounds that are made and any sounds the whale hears. So now we're really almost like terrestrial biologists, right? So you can see what the whales are doing and you can get the context in which they're doing it. So, and then some of them have video tags. So they have a video camera. Now you're sitting on the back of a whale, or you're looking a second, now you are. So now the whale's just swimming around and videotaping everything that's around it. These are all sand lance fish that you're seeing um, bopping around here. Can I this one? Maybe I did. And I like this because you took a picture of my boat. Yeah. One of you took a picture of our boat and we're all standing there waiting to us. Yeah, but I like it. So here's the animal's eating. Um, this big dip here is because the animal's opened its mouth, so you can actually know when the animal's opened its mouth to feed. Um, it's blowing bubbles, what you're seeing there, they could pump that well to blow bubbles to track fish. We'll talk more about that later. So there you go, there's sand lance. Because all of this is really them trying to catch your sand lance. Again, that big dip, mouth open, upper jaw, lower jaw, there's another one there, but it's mouth open as well. All sand lance going by. So, pretty cool. So we, we decided we actually needed to combine these tags. So we, put, we decided we needed to put two tags on at the same time. So one of them is the video tag, and one is the, oops. Sorry, you guys already saw that. Tags on, right? okay. So after we did that, the animals were going to sleep. It was a little frustrating, because we had it all checked out, ready to all these great data, and they just went to sleep. But the good part of that is that when you're tagging animals, you can't tag them all, right? And one of the things you worry about is that if you tag them, they're going to behave differently than the animals that aren't tagged. 
So the fact that these animals just got tagged and then decided to go to sleep right after um, told us that we're really not bothering them too much and that the data that we're collecting are probably pretty representative of what the animals are going to do in the this, this is a National Geographic critter cam. Um, we don't use it anymore. The ones we use now are way, way small. But this is actually the very first uh, camera tag that were made. But they were large. So. So that was whales. But we also do birds. So how do you catch a seabird? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, for great shear waters, and one of the reasons we work with great shear waters is because they will do this, um, you can toss in uh, fish traps and things next to the boat, and they'll pop in and, and wreck them close, and then you catch them, and we put them in these little cat carriers, um, and they get very comfortable. And there's a little fishy thing here, and the nice thing is that we've got all these holes in it, we put uh, aluminum foil down underneath, so when they defecate, we now have that. Um, so we can look at the DNA and their excrement to see what they've been eating. And we do all sorts of other stuff. Uh, we yeah, find them, of course. Uh, we actually put little gas masks on them, and they breathe into that, so we can uh, get, say, lice of data and what they've been eating from their exhaled gas, and that tells us what they've been eating in the last couple of hours. Oops. And we take blood. That'll tell us what they've been eating in the last couple of weeks. And then feathers will tell us what they've been eating in the last seven months. So it's a really um, pretty confident way of looking at how they're making their lives. And then we put these tags on them. These little satellite tags, they're about 15 grams. There, there's a rule for tagging birds that you don't want your tags weighing more than 3% of the body weight of the bird. So the birds we tag are usually we're a little more conservative than that, are usually 750 to 1,000 grams. 1,000 gram birds is about as big as they get. So then we let them go, put the tags on, we let them go, and then they fly around the Gulf of Maine. And these are different tracks of different birds. And by doing that, then we can start looking at how they use the Gulf of Maine, where they spend most of the time, why they spend their time there, and give us a really good look um, where, where they're interacting with fishing gear. Uh, so all sorts of different things that we can learn from, from these tagged birds. And we've now tagged about 90 over the course of 10 years. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about before we get into action the results are uh, our sand lance work. And so, uh, sand lance are going to be caught in these little areas here. So, each one of those dots is where we have a site, and we go to that site and we drop a little stub down, and it takes a grab sample. And because sand lance will bury themselves in the sand, we can pull up that bunch of sand, and we can count how many are there. So, we have a good idea of how many and where they are. Okay, so what happens now? A lot. But <laughs> 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 it's true. <laughs> One of the innovations that we made is, is a, a friend of mine, Colin Ware at UNH, uh, developed this particular way. He's just a data visualization guru. It's just absolutely incredible. And so he invented this thing called a track plot for our whale data. And basically, these are the whale tracks coming from those tags. So the tags go on the whale, I forgot to say it. You know, they'll stay on, these are really high resolution tags. So they'll stay on really for, for 10 to 40 hours, somewhere in that range. So not designed like satellite tags of the birds to show you where they go all over the place. These are just trying to tell us in really high resolution what the whales are doing in a small space in time. So Colin designed this way to pull data out of the tags to create these three-dimensional depictions or data visualizations, not depictions, of what the whales are doing. So this is the path of the whale. These little polygrams going up and down, polygons, uh, those are flute strokes, right? So the whale moves through the water like this, powered by the flutes. So every time one of those flutes um, goes up or down, it's left in the track and Colin pulls those out. So here we can see the animal swimming along the surface. It's diving, swimming along the surface, it's diving swimming along the surface diving. Notice something that's missing when it's diving? This is a bit of a surprise to me. They're not fluking at all when they dive. They're using absolutely no energy. They're just gliding down to the bottom. And this is because as they will get deeper when they're on the surface, they're buoyant. But as they start to dive, the pressure starts to crush their chest and they've got bones that are really poorly articulated in their thoracic cavity. So they can actually just to collapse their lungs and they become more dense as they go deeper 
and they just glide down to the bottom. Then they have to fluke around the bottom, and then they have to fluke when they go to the top. Except as they're going up, of course, the pressure of the water is decreasing, their body cavity is starting to expand, and they then just glide right up to the surface. So a really energy efficient way to move. So again, the whole idea of, of animals and life in general is to conserve energy in production. And so this is one of the ways that they do that. But what's really cool about this, that, and that's pretty cool too, but what's really cool is that when we started to look at the pitch roll and heading data, it came in two blacks. So this is a what's called a scattergram. And these two areas, this is when the animal's body is zero pitch and zero roll. So basically they're just at the surface like that. But then there was this whole other group of data that said the data were 30 degrees down and 90 degrees over. And that's that. So on the bottom, the animal was spending a lot of time rolling on their side with their heads pitched down. We didn't, we've never seen that before. Like, what the heck is going on? So what is going on? I've already told you a little bit. Who's the star of our talk? <laughs> Samites. So these are Samites. They bury themselves in the bottom. And when something big comes, they come scooting out of the bottom. Now, I thought that was so stupid when I started seeing these. Ones. Why would they do that? Right? I mean, if you're safe in the bottom, you didn't even stay there. <laughs> But when I started thinking about it, a friend of mine who was doing seal research in Canada sent me a video, and the way seals catch sand lines is they go down to the bottom and they bite into the sand, swallow it, regurgitate it, and then eat the sand lines to keep floating back out. So given the fact that there was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seals versus you know, tens and tens of thousands of whales, it's probably smarter to get out of the, out of the sand when you see something coming and staying in. So I think evolutionary it does make sense, despite my first thought that they're totally idiots. <laughs> so right, so here we go. Um, feeding on the bottom, this kind of orientation, left side down. When we look at them, they've got these abrasions just on the left side. I should say that most whales are right-handed, in about the same proportion that people are right-handed and left-handed. That's kind of cool. Um, but again, the early thoughts were that the or the early recognition of this is that maybe they're feeding on the bottom because we're seeing all this stuff marking on the head. And then this stuff just really confirmed it. Good stuff out. So sand ants also dictate humpback whale behavior because their behavior is that they'll come up to the surface during the daytime and then they go down to the bottom mostly at night. So what does that mean? So for humpback whales, during the day, they're doing some, you guys also mentioned direct geographical, they blow bubbles and stuff to catch fish, right? So humpback whales are really neat in that they blow bubbles and they create nets out of these bubbles. And then the fish get contained in the nets and they just come up with them and scoop them up. <coughs> so this is what they do during the day. And this is one of the track plot visions of, of what that looks like. So they'll do this in the daytime and then at night, They'll go down to the bottom. This is sand lance during the day. This is sand lance during the night. Those are from echo sounders that were running while we were doing the doing research. So kind of max where the fish are. And what's really kind of neat is that there's this call that they make. It goes boom, boom, boom. And the humpbacks make that call when they're on the bottom, if it's at night or if the water's really deep. And if there's another whale around. So if there's no other whale around, it might go and turn outside, but it doesn't make the call. If it's at night, where they can't see each other, they use the call. If it's in the daytime, where they can't see each other, they don't use the call. So it seems that it's a contact call, so they can coordinate their movements underwater when they can't see each other. So there we are at night. Folks right here, there are in deep water. So both of those are going to have that boom, 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 contact call. And when we were first working with this also, we were trying to tag multiple animals in the same forward. It's hard to get one tag on a whale. I, I showed you like uh, 30 seconds of so easy. Sometimes it takes hours to do that. And why you guys sit here for hours long? You know, so you really got what it's like. But it takes a lot longer than you think. Tagging multiple animals in the same group, they're on to you, right? You're going to go, don't let these guys in close. So, but every once in a while we need to be able to do it. These don't look like whales to you, but believe me, they are whales. So not polyglots. And there's actually two whales here. One's red and one's blue. 
and there are one, two, three, four dies in this figure. So basically what this says is that animals are at the surface, they dive down, and at the bottom, they go head to head, and then go back to the surface. And they do that over and over again. I said, I don't know why. That seems too crazy. Um, which is why we got the video tags. Because it's saying that this is what they're doing on the bottom. So do they? So we got the video tags. So you now the thing is, they do this mostly at night or in really deep water. What's the problem with video at night in really deep water? You can't see anything, right? So we had a lot of tags we couldn't see anything, but here's where we were lucky they were in shallow water during the day, and there they are, going head to head. There's, you're on the back of this animal. Let's see if they can do it again. <clears throat> I might have to get this part. But there was the sand ones. So there's upper jaw, upper jaw. You're on the back of this animal. Its upper jaw is going to be there. Its lower jaw down there. And then there's a the third one right there. Upper jaw, lower jaw. So basically, you're coming together um, in a corral like that. So again, you're on the back of this animal. You're seeing, remember I told you about that dip when the animal opens its lower of its mouth? So there's that dip. So upper jaw, lower jaw, lower jaw, upper jaw, upper jaw, lower jaw. So they're just coming together like a pinwheel. Um, to capture these, corral these fish into each other's mouths. Remember, the fish are in the bottom, and the facts, and if they want to get eaten, hint, they do not. <laughs> so one of the things you're wondering, is there a method to what they're doing, or are they really just in the same place at the same time, just trying to crash into the same party? So there's fish there, so all these whales are just in the same place at the same time, and you know, it looks like they're doing something together, but they're really not. So how are we going to figure that out? So we, did, we took the data and we look at the heading and orientation of the animal relative group members. So this is the whale with the tag. Okay? Colored blocks indicate particular individual whales that we can identify as individuals. So we know if the same animal is doing the same thing over and over again. So compass heading is in degrees up here. And then, yes. Okay, and relative orientation is in clock hours around here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, a series of motions by this particular tag animal, it's going to be moving around, taking different headings, and the key is to see how these whales, do they stay in the same position every time, same, like they're working together, or are they just crashing around um, in various orientations? So here we go. So that animal is coming at this school in different directions, but the other animals are maintaining the same orientation relative to that animal over and over again, which are the most efficient ones if you're trying to go head to head. And this is just the same thing. In this particular um, series of events, a particular animal, nice thing, we can identify all these animals by the markings on the bodies. But in 28 events, uh, 90, almost 95% of this animal is at the one o'clock position. Seven, seven events, 100% in the 11 o'clock. So again, they're maintaining the same positions, dive after dive, uh, feeding dive after feeding dive after feeding dive. So it certainly would, would tend to make you think that they're actually working together, particularly if you add um, the fact that if they can see each other, they're not making that call. If they can't see each other, they are making the call. So there's a lot going on here, um, all trying to capture away. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so humpback behavior, is your, I mentioned the, uh, the bubble net. This is, this is what it looks like at the surface. So they'll come down, they'll start at the outer ring, and they'll do concentrically closer rings, and keep blowing bubbles and bubbles, and then again they'll come up and capture the fish through there. Mm -hmm. And then this is what they're doing on the bottom. So that, that's behavior, but how about numbers? Uh, when we look at how many humpback whales there are, Regardless of our sand banks data, we find that the abundance of humpback whales is very much similar to the abundance of, of sand banks. This is a, another way of looking at it. It's called the Global Index of Co-location. And basically, that took our sand banks data and our whale data. And we said, if we add those together, are they on top of each other, or are they really far apart? So that Global Index of Co-location GIC ranges from zero, where they're just totally far apart. And one is when they're right on top of each other. And we took all of our data, and Tammy Civil was my postdoc then, uh, 
did some this analysis, and they're all on top of each other. So 0.99 with one being as high as you can get with the co-location. So humpback whales are the same hands out. So that's forget humpback whales now. We'll go to this. So the sandy seabirds, great shearwaters are flying around. We're mapping where they are. These maps, so these are where they are in different years. Da, 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 da. Um, you see some places, the red is where they're spending most of their time. Over here, the yellow is where they're spending most of their time. And then these black dots are where the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, which is one of the, of the big science groups in the government, they go out and they capture fish in the trawls. And they count them and see who's there, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to know where the sandlands were. So these black dots are where the sandlands are. So the yellow is where the shearwaters are, and the black is where sandlands are. And so again, the sandlands and shearwaters are very close together in terms of location. So Tammy did this again for shearwaters and sandlands. Um, global index of co-location, 0.95. Not 0.99, uh, but pretty darn good. And then we looked at, you know, I told you about the fecal samples. You know, we have, have all this aluminum foil sitting in the bottom of the, the cat carriers and birds go to the bathroom and then they send it out to be analyzed. And sandlands are the number one species that we found in those um, fecal remains. I didn't have a picture of that either. <laughs> so global location, if you put all these things together for sandlands, humpback whales, and shearwaters, uh, it's 0.99. So again, they're all found in the same place at the same time. We're going to get to why that's important. And, and commercial fish. Same thing. This is stomach contents. Brian Smith at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center um, did a bunch of data for us where you look at all these different species, fish species and where are sandlands in their feeding. Um, cod, number one thing they eat is sandlands. Uh, haddock, number four. Uh, Yellowtail flounder, number four. So sandlands are extremely important um, for a lot of these commercial fish species. Tammy looked at where nets were. So if you're pulling a net on, on the bottom, um, you pull up your catch, uh, if you have sandlands and cod and sandlands in these different species. Uh, we have to use that one. So global index of co-location using that for sandlands and flatfish, 0.997. Sandlands and cod, 0.968, I think it says. Um, sandlands and haddock, 0.6. Mm -hmm. So again, the take home message here is that, that sandlands are important for whales, for seabirds, and for fish. I'll talk in a second. So, a little bit more about sandlands, and, and this becomes a little bit more of concern. So, we've created this great picture, right, of a, a national sanctuary that's totally diverse, um, lots of whales, lots of seagulls, lots of fish. Um, really dependent though on one particular uh, forage is sandlands. So we worked with a, a good friend, Hans Bowman, who's from Yukon, and he's, he's a fish biologist and ecologist. And we went out and we caught sandlands and trawled for them, and then we picked them up when they were spawning, and they spawned right at Thanksgiving, which is very inconvenient for us. Uh, so they only spawn in a very one week window, right around Thanksgiving. We must take Thanksgiving off that day. <coughs> so, luckily, Hans and my team decided we didn't want to. Uh, and so we caught sandlands when they were in spawning condition, and then we squeezed some eggs out, and we squeezed sperm out, and we, we um, fertilized the eggs and brought them back to Hannes' lab. So this is a very cool lab. Each one of these containers has sandlands, and then he can control the temperature that he's going to raise them under, and also the PCA2 levels, so how much uh, carbon dioxide is in the water. And you can do that at very fine scales. And then he can raise the fish and see what happens. And it is not good. So these are our sandlads eggs. Uh, here's one that actually hatched. Uh, these are ones that, um, that did not hatch, fully developed, but didn't hatch. So over here, you can see the big data. Fully developed on hatch, under lower conditions of carbon, PCO2, basically carbon dioxide in the water. Um, you get increasing levels of fish that do not hatch. Um, hatch if you see it goes down under increasing levels and the rest are decayed like these here. Um, so the ones with the eggs just become messed up, uh, become increasingly problematic 
under increased ECO2 levels. So under future conditions, the reproductive success of salmon is going to be going way, way down. And these were one of the highest, um, most sensitive species that have been tested to date, unfortunately. So this is looking at salmon again from some of our data. Basically over here, you're looking at salmon in uh, the cocoa pods in a salmon diet. So we're catching the salmon and then we're looking at stomachs to see what's in their stomachs. And it starts in February. Yeah, there we go. Great. I think that was a big surprise. It's a really bad surprise. So here we're looking at, at salmon in their stomachs. So salmon basically, whoop, salmon basically come up come out in February because they're looking to feed on cocoa pods and they come out in February. So again, we can see this correspondence, sand lance, if they're attracting the calamus, zooplankton, and toes, they come in February, same thing with this um, sand lance diet, going up, going up, going up. So they're feeding starting in February and really they end in July. And this is also showing how fat they get. So they're eating, of course, to get fat. Salmon are capital breeders. In other words, they don't feed when they're spawning. So they have to build up all this fat content and then they wait to spawn. So this is how that works. So intense feeding from February to, to June and July. Then they're not feeding, so they build up lots of fat stores. And then they stop feeding and they come down, they lose fat, they lose fat. This is when they spawn, remember Thanksgiving. And after that, they're just almost depleted. They're just like a flat bag. Um, and so now, though, they still have to survive. So they now have to live until they start feeding again in February. So if the sand, we talked about that phenology, you know, the timing of different things in the ocean, if copepods aren't there when the adult sand lines need them to be in February, well, then the adults will starve. And in addition, if the water is warmer, the metabolism of the sand lines will stay higher, so they actually need more fat to survive. So we've got like a triple landing going on. Reproductive success under future conditions will be decreased. Uh, adult starvation will be increased. Oh, and, and calamus is moving north, like a lot of things. As the ocean is warming, calamus were at the southern edge of their distribution grid. So as the ocean warms, these incredibly important calamus copepods are going to move north also, leaving everything that needs to eat them to either move north with them or behind. Salmon can't really move. A lot of forest fish like herring and mackerel are migratory and they swim around all the time. Salmon, you still have them sitting in the sand bottom, they are confined to those sand habitats. So when they go down there, they'll, um, they'll hatch out, uh, they'll be a free floating larva, so really about three months, a pretty long time for fish. But when they go down to the sand habitat, they spend the rest of their lives right in that habitat. So if that habitat becomes unsuitable, they can't just say, oh, I think I'll just swim a couple hundred miles north. Um, they'll just die in that area where they won't have anything um, like sand lands in it. So what's going to happen? These are our three main players here. Shear waters, humpbacks, sand lands. So I think we just went over this. High locational sand lands are not predators. Sand lands are super CO2 sensitive. Um, there's a, synthet, a synergistic negative effect for water temperature. Um, so what's going to happen? Well, we, we kind of have an idea what's going to happen because we've seen these things play out. So here we have a year with lots of sand lands because again, we're measuring these sand lands in that way that I told you. So here we've got a bunch of sand lands in this year all in the southwest corner. So where were the whales? All in the southwest corner, 97 sightings. Where were the seabirds? Again, almost all in the southwest corner, 1,400 sightings. Uh, these are our seabirds that are our satellite track, a huge batch of them right here on, on the southwest corner where, where those salmons were. This is my friend Duke Robin. She was satellite tagging humpback whales on this uh, on a whole different project during the same time. This is Stell Lighting, oops. This is Stel, something part of Stell Lighting Bank right there. Uh, and so there they are on the southern part of Still Lightning Bank, and they're reaching down here to the Great South Channel. So that's in the year with lots of sand In In 2012, we had a really, really warm year. So we started our project in 2013. We didn't find a single sand I thought maybe our, our method is terrible. 
and we didn't find any. Something's wrong with the way we did it. Except the next year, we brought a lot. So 2012 was really hot. So again, we're talking about some of the temperature problems with the adult starvation. Um, so probably that's what happened. So we caught no salmons. We didn't see any where had we saw one baleen whale. Like we weren't counting birds that year. Uh, but the satellite birds were out there, and ten, we had ten bird tags, ten birds tagged, and this is where they were. But that's 36 points. We well, get 20 points from bird in a day for locations. So basically, this is like a bird coming and just going. Coming and just leaving. So really no use of oh, still lagging bank in that year by birds. And this is due satellite tag humpback whales. This is where the cell light bank is, and they didn't use it at all. So we have a pretty good idea what's going to happen um, if there are no salmon banks for, for these, uh, really to feed the whole cell lighting system, which is going to be a, a relatively empty place. There we go. Now, commercial fish. Fishers are just as, in, as important, if not more, certainly commercially, um, and they're extremely depending on water temperature. So this is a, a pig by John here, and he's just looking at how many fish can be negative, fish species are going to be negatively impacted by climate change, neutral, and positive. Some of them, actually, are going to be positively affected because they're going to expand their range. And here's one you can't read it, but it says um, northern kingfish. And just this Friday, a friend of mine is this great fisherman, um, has fished all his life up here, and he sends me this picture of this fish, and he goes, what is this? this, this I just took this picture from my, from my text. Uh, he goes, what is this? And that is the northern kingfish. They're not supposed to be up here. Well, they're not supposed to be up here. They're certainly they're supposed to be up here under these conditions, uh, but usually they're in the Gulf of Mexico and not going much further than the Atlantic. And now here they are in Cape Cod. And he also just texted me today and said, can we call it Tarpon and Mashpee? Tarpon and Mashpee, this is crazy. And so the ocean is changing quickly right before our eyes. Okay, but, so you get that whole story. The next one is, can the oceans do anything about that? You know, can the oceans actually help us with climate change? The answer is yes. How? Or good how? <laughs> okay, a lot of words here. Um, but basically, the ocean is a carbon sink. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the ocean draws that down into the water column by using phytoplankton. Phytoplankton have to have uh, carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. So you all know that most of the oxygen for the world comes from phytoplankton. Well, a great deal of carbon is drawn from the atmosphere by photosynthesis <coughs> also. So the way this works is that it all goes down to the bottom after they die. So here's, here's the kind of the depiction of it. So you get atmospheric CO2 dissolved into the ocean water. And then this stuff sinks. Okay. You get organic matter, phytoplankton, zooplankton, all these things that are living and dying. And a, a friend of mine just wrote this great book, um, Eat, Poop, and Die, which is basically talking about this whole system um, and, and in reverse. If part of it is you're sequestering or, or you know, drawing carbon from the atmosphere and hiding it down at the bottom of the ocean, where it's really lost to the system, so it's just going to sit there. But remember, I talked about in those first slides about upwellings. We need upwellings to bring stuff up to the surface to create good phytoplankton and habitat. So hang on with that. But anyway, carbon is really drawn. A healthy ocean draws a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. My friend, the beach, I don't that. Some of the things I put up there, I don't remember. This is my brilliant people up there. This is Joe's book that I was just talking about. <laughs> and so one of the things it has in there is that migratory fish can move about 1.5 billion tons of carbon each year from the surface to the bottom, which is about what the aviation industry emits every year. So huge amounts that, that um, can be taken out of the atmosphere. Whales, International Monetary Fund, not a bastion of conservation scientists, I have to say, uh, calculated that uh, one whale takes out 33 tons of carbon to its body. And also, they also help produce phytoplankton. Remember I said how much phytoplankton are being are pulling that carbon out of the atmosphere? Like, whales make phytoplankton? That seems kind of crazy. <laughs> I should remember I did these things. <laughs> 
So this is, this is how it worked. And Joe actually developed this on a research trip uh, because he came with us and he had this idea that whales are actually taking nutrients from the bottom. They're acting like it's uplevels. So they take nutrients from the bottom. When they go to the surface, for various reasons, they don't go to the bathroom on the bottom. They go to the bathroom at the surface. And where do you need those nutrients? You need those nutrients at the surface. So this is what Joe calls the whale pump. Whale comes down here into the bottom, goes to the surface, um, excretes, fertilizes the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton um, is really rich in those areas, draws carbon out of the atmosphere so that it can live and grow, and then that is sequestered down at the bottom. And, and a good example of this is the Southern Ocean Crow Paradox. This is just such a great story. Um, because they kill, you know, millions of, of large whales in the South Ocean around Antarctica. And people say, oh man, they all they all the eat their scrub. Um, I have a friend that works down there. And he goes, not that whales are so lazy. You know, they don't even die. They just kind of open their mouths and kind of slowly close them and just take a huge amounts of crow. So people say, well, now all those whales are gone, the crow population is just going to explode, except that it didn't. I said, well, how could that be? I mean, all these whales are no longer eating these crow, and there's less crow than ever. Well, it turns out, look at the next slide, it's a lot. It turns out that the Antarctic Ocean is iron deficient. And when whales are feeding, they take in and concentrate iron in their bodies, and then they go up and excrete it along the surface, and create the situation that phytoplankton can use to really explode. Without that nitrogen, excuse me, without that iron being added to the system, the whole system crashed, and the, it's far less productive now than it ever was. So if you ruin this whale pump, um, there are huge ecological um, loss we have. Now, in the southern ocean is iron deficient, and the ocean we are is nitrogen. So up here, it's more important to be taking nitrogen and putting it into the photic zone, the part where the sun is, the phytoplankton. Down there, it's more important for iron. Now, we're going to get into stuff that I actually do do research on. I don't do any research down in Antarctica. Although, listen, I are going down here next year. Hey. <laughs> so there's this cool gas called dimethyl sulfide. I'm going to repeat that like 10 times before I can actually say dimethyl sulfide. I thought it was over it. But now I've got a pretty good at it. Uh, but it's much easier to say DMS. I'm going to say DMS um, for most of this talk, which is the short for dying off of So it's a climate gas we've never heard of. So basically what this is saying is that phytoplankton have dying off of in their bodies. And they have it there to control osmotic pressure and other things. So it's in their bodies. When zooplankton eat it, this dying off of is just released into the water column. And then it gets diffused into the atmosphere. And it's a sulfur material, so it's a cloud forming material. So when you have this kind of sulfide going up into the atmosphere, it actually creates clouds. And those clouds then can reflect sunlight back into the atmosphere and keep the um, keep people from overly warm, keep it from warm. And we have a great example of that, if you just figure it out. In the 500s, we had Oh, I say, a mini ice age. It was snowing in, um, in southern China in the, in the summertime. It was like people who didn't even see the sun for months at a time in the summertime. Uh, and it turned out that there were three volcanoes that happened right around 550 AD uh, that basically blanketed the world with the sulfur, which created huge cloud banks across the entire world and reduced the temperature enough that it was snowing in the summertime. Huge starvation, talk about global chaos, climate chaos, right? People were starving all over the planet uh, because of this. There, there's a guy in um, Woods Hole, I can't remember his name right now, talking about this with iron in the Southern Oceans. And he said, you give me a tanker full of, of iron, I'll be in an ice age um, because of this situation with dimethyl sulfide. So I do do about about dimethyl sulfide, um, but not the climate, although I'm learning about how cool it is to climate. But I usually do it for white whales. And the reason for this is because we want to try to predict where white whales are. You guys know about white whales, the rarest large whale on the planet right now, going down the tubes. So because Calamus copepods munch on phytoplankton, if there's lots of Calamus copepods, you get increased chances of white whales in the area. 
So we're trying to look and see if increased talus abundance equals increased EMS equals increased right row abundance. And the answer is yes. So here we are with our, uh, our little machine um, that, that measures down the sulfide every seven minutes or so. And we go around, we count right whales well while we're measuring down the sulfide. And the red dots are where down the sulfide is, and the black crosses and red crosses are where right whales are. And the right whales are being found in the highest levels of down the sulfide. So, so EMS is a gas release until the plankton um, is eaten. Or stuff and so plankton is phytoplankton, it's cloud forming, more plankton, more zooplankton, um, more cloud blocking. So the ocean can um, have the ability to actually um, not save us from climate change, but it's probably help from climate change for many, many eons. And this is basically just that, that picture depicting that. Okay, sunshine, ocean warms, enhanced phytoplankton growth, more DMS. Elevated mass concentration in the atmosphere, forms clouds, bounces solar radiation back. So, just for one last story, climate change in North Atlantic right whales. Again, the conservation issue of our time, um, certainly climate change is, is huge uh, for particular species going extinct. Um, right whales will be extinct in, in the life of people in this room if things don't change. So, one of the problems was due to climate change. So this is a, a right whale feeding on copepods. For a long time, we had this really good look at what the distribution of right whales were. They were down in the southeast cabin area during the wintertime. They'd come up to Cape Cod and the Great South Channel in the spring and early summer. And then they'd go up to the Bay of Fundy and Browns Bank and Roseway Basin. And they did this year after year after year after year after decade after decade, maybe for who knows how long. But all of a sudden, they left the Bay of Fundy. They left the Great South Channel. They left Rosalie and Brown's Basin. Nobody knew where they went. But it turns out, they went up here to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Hadn't been there before. Nobody knew they were going to be there. This is just some friends of mine. I used to work in the Indian Islands. Uh, and this is their data from 1980 to 2020. And no white whales, no white whales. All of a sudden, look at all these white whales. Again, no white whales, no white whales. Look at all these white whales. That has real implications for right whales. This is mortality in right whales. A number here, years, and all of a sudden, in Canada in 2017, we get this huge spike, like 14 dead in one, one season. Now, it's kind of cool here. Uh, no, let, me, let me stay at the other story. And this is because of climate change. So the copepod members in the Gulf of Maine uh, went way down. And the Coke pod numbers in the Gulf of St. Lawrence went way up, and so the right whales moved where the sea was. But nobody is ready for them to do that. Down here, we have ship strike rules, ship, ships have to go slow, we have fishing gear modifications. Canada had none of that. So they went up there and just got hammered. But Canada took some pretty active uh, measures, and in 2018, they didn't have any right whale deaths. So they said, oh, well, this is pretty good. Let's dial back those measures. And they dialed back those measures, and in 2019, the numbers went right up again. And then they put the measures back in place, and so we've got some good uh, grand induction. So it just shows we can do it, right? It is possible to say, right, or else um, we're just not doing a very good job of it. So, climate chaos, as I said, um, I guess that just, I think, illustrated the chaos and the opportunity that is there. It's an opportunity to say, right, or else we know what it is. We just don't have the social and political will at this time to do it. So, what can you do? You can buy and eat local, and this is going to talk about you can just eat local channels to take a bit off. Do you want to do that before I ask, answer your questions? I forgot to tell you, I, it looks like I stay awake usually by getting my own voice too long. I fall asleep. <laughs> so, I usually let people ask questions when I'm doing um, but I got off on a roll. Yeah, okay. Any questions now? Yeah. Yes, thank you. For anybody that has questions, we have questions. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Overview, fantastic, it's great. Um, we've seen porpoises 
of the passive uh, summer, and all no strong this summer we've never seen before. Is that something you're studying as well? And uh, is there related to what we've been talking about? Probably. I actually wrote an endangered species um, petition for Harbor Corpus back in the mid 90s. Um, they were getting really hammered by fishing gear, and now there's some, again, those made some good uh, management decisions to keep them out of fishing gear. So, part of the corpus numbers are going up. So, part of what we're seeing is just there's more corpus around. Um, but, probably also, uh, you know, they're usually out of view uh, by end of April. So, if you're seeing them here now, um, it's probably less climate change, but more just than reoccupying ranges that they used to, used to have, but just didn't get to the numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Is there an estimate now of how many right whales are in the St. Lawrence? There are. Um, I think they counted over 100 of them fairly recently. And again, since there's only 340 um, left on the planet, that's a lot. Um, doesn't mean you're counting all of them either. On Cape Cod Bay is incredible for that. You know, two thirds of the right whales on the planet will be in Cape Cod Bay in the spring. I mean, it's just a, an amazing place. Sometimes even more than that. By spring, what, what, oh, what spring? They'll, they'll start arriving like in January, and then the peak will be March and April, and then they'll start leaving in May. So the state of Massachusetts has done great stuff for right whales. Um, you know, you can't fish in Cape Cod Bay during those months. Um, and a lot of Massachusetts Bay is now closed to fishing. Um, so the state of Massachusetts is just been amazing. And then lobster, of course, are another great climate change story. Uh, there's no lobster, we see a huge lobster fishery south of, of Cape Cod and Long Island, um, Rhode Island. And now that fishery is basically gone because of climate change. The water's so warm that they're getting just shell disease um, that kills them. And so they, that fishery is just gone. The history of Massachusetts and Maine has gone berserk, I mean, fabulously, um, because that warmer weather, water, water, warmer water temperature has the uh, lobster going faster in those states. But that will catch up. Massachusetts will be the first one to lose its fishery, then Maine, and the same group to Canada. Now, people talk a lot about gray seals on Monterey, and there's like 30,000 gray seals there now. I can remember uh, reading an article about the very first gray seal pups being born in Monterey, and there's like six of them. But that's a temporary thing because we're at the southern edge of the thermal ability of, of pumping for a gray whale. That's why they're not on Long Island. That's why they're not, you know, down in the Atlantic because it's too warm for them there. It'll soon be too warm for them to pump on Monterey and that, like everything else, that would be more. So it's a temporary, temporary issue. Um, I heard that they've started to harvest krill. People have started to harvest krill in the Arctic. And that that's affecting the whale populations? Do you know? Probably. You know, if, if we leave whales alone, they are so good at being whales. Right? Like, you know, what we do is we take their food, we hit them with boats, we catch them fishing gear. They're not so good at that stuff. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. When you start taking their food, you're, you're hitting them right where it hurts the most. Uh, I, I've been working a lot with sand lands in, in policy. I'm just kind of a conservation biologist. So I don't want to just do research and then put it in a, a publication. And I want to have some management um, results in my work. Uh, so right now, the, the sand lance fishery in the North Sea is the biggest fishery in the world, or one of the biggest fisheries in the world, huge. Um, we don't have a sand lance fishery here just because it hasn't developed. So I'm trying to keep one from developing. The state of Massachusetts has banned the landing of more than 200 pounds of sand lance per person in Massachusetts waters. Specifically, to keep an industrial fish, and it's an industrial fish, so fish food, for meat food, things like that. Um, so Massachusetts led the way in, in doing that with the in my effort. Um, the Rhode Island and Connecticut have now followed suit, so all three of those states have now banned um, what basically is, is will keep any industrial fishery uh, for salmon from occurring in these waters. So now, now we've got to work on the New York and Maine. It's slow. Um, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but how do you think uh, anthropogenic noise affects failing whale distribution? The anthropogenic affects their distribution, but it definitely affects them. So we do a lot of work on noise. So we have past acoustic um, we see with all of the cell line, and we also have the ability to track boats as they go through. 
and we found that great whales lost about 80% of their communication space. So if you model right whales, if they're just bumbling around, they'll scour them because they just don't bumble into the big masses of cobalt that they need to survive. If you create the model so that they communicate to each other that there's a resource here, so you get aggregated on it, then they will survive. So losing that communication space is, is not mine. Uh, one of the things I, you know, each one of those talks I, I, I kind of touched on is like an hour talk in itself. So um, I missed it, I skipped a lot of stuff. But the, um, I was talking about that baboon, baboon sound that the humpback whales make in the feeding environment. And the boat goes by, they stop feeding. They just wait for the boat to go by because they can't feed it. So they wait for the boat to go by and then they start feeding again. Now, if what you're thinking about is the, the mortality is attacking along the Atlantic, if people are talking about wind farms, I'm likely to feed the cause of those mortalities. They're still getting hit by boats in some kind of fishing here. Now, wind farms may be bringing more boats to the area, and that's possible, um, but it's not the wind farm noise that's, that's killing those ways, in, in my somewhat professional opinion. How many people would have to eat locally to make a difference in the CO2 levels? Yeah, I don't think there's any good number for that, but that's, you know, that's really not the point. But the point is that if everybody's doing it, then it's going to have some measurable effect. We don't know what it is now, but we know it's doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the point is, a lot of these things that are difficult to say, this is going to be my footprint reduction. But, you know, doing something is way better than doing nothing. I like hanging my clothes in line. It's free for one. Um, but also, um, it's one of the things that I can do that is going to reduce my footprint. And there aren't, you know, a whole lot. I still have to to work. You know, I have a highway, but it's still, still making a mess. So I think we all have to do anything that we can um, to improve. Not, nothing's, there's no silver bullet um, that any of us individually can do. But we can, you know, in mass, do a lot. And of course, the biggest thing is to vote. Right? The biggest thing is to vote for things that, that support green energy and climate change. And, and fish conservation and whale conservation and you know I, I'm still amazed that you know it used to be just we don't need to build more power plants we just need to to be more efficient and that's kind of dying away before we really got efficient right? so I, I think again we're, we're missing what to me is the critical step which is efficiency rather than production whether it's green production or or fossil fuel production so that's me yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to uh, believe it, but as I understand it, we do still live in an ice age. And that we are trending towards the next glacial maximum. And that over the last two uh, million years, glacial age is awesome. We go up and down. And so we have been in a trending warming period since the end of the last glacial. Uh, Descent starting 20,000 or so years ago. Is research done trying to project the correlation between man made uh, global warming, which appears to be so extreme, relative to the natural implied rising of temperature through the continuum of the melting of the glaciers naturally? That would be a climate scientist question. I'm a conservation biologist. <laughs> I can't help you with that one. <laughs> they can trace where the carbon dioxide is coming from. They, the, there's a signature in the carbon itself that tells you if it's a, if it's a man released carbon or if it's a natural carbon. And so there is no doubt about the fact that the rise in carbon dioxide is coming from human sources. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Well, that's what it does. But, but there are, as, as you're saying, there are natural oscillations based on, on the tilt of, of the Earth and wobble in its orbit. So there's all sorts of things that go on as well. But, but there's no, no question that this is a, a man-made issue. Human is a human issue. Uh, are you optimistic or interested in what could be done technologically to accelerate that? 
Well, well I am, but again, I'm kind of a soft technology person. I, 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 I get tired of the fact that technology is going to bail us out of every single stupid thing we do. <laughs> so, so I would much rather see us um, use energy more wisely, um, take conservation steps that will um, reduce our carbon footprint without more production, uh, rather than saying, oh, you know, technology is going to bail us out from every one thing we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, right, right now, anything is, is worth a try. And these are technologies that I, I read about the same as anybody else. I, I have really no personal experience with them. I think we have time for one more. Is there one more? Okay, so I guess I don't think we have it. Can I just speak? Would you talk a little bit about the uh, fishing gear that, that, that we produce to um, help with the entangling? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, there were weak links in fishing gear so that if right whales get in them, uh, the hope was that it would break. And keep them from getting entangled. Um, and that was part of my research that really looked better than it ultimately was. So, you know, all this fishing gear has weak links in them, but it really has not resulted in many fewer um, right whale deaths. So the, the thing that has to be done now, and the technology again is there, is that you have to be able to fish without vertical lines in the water. So, you know, it's already complicated rules, and part of our showing where whales use the water pond is part of uh, making that will happen. I'm going to show the whales are going right down to the bottom. The lobster here used to have, and it surprises the lobster, we thought it was the only one that was going to be a big problem. Um, but because there's so much lobster gear out there, the lobster gear is really the main issue. So it used to be that they're going to use polypropylene line, which floats. And so between the tracks, all this line is floating up between the tracks, you know, 100 feet apart, and making a perfect loop to catch whales. So one of the first things that Noah did, and part of this whole tape reduction team process, which is a, a group of like 60 or 70 people get together, they're fishermen, scientists, conservationists, um, resource managers, state fishing people, and they all get together and try to figure out how to solve these things. The meeting since 1995. We really haven't solved anything. But, but we have to make some progress. So, um, so anyway, now that floating line has been banned and bought back, and so fishermen use sinking line that lies nice along the line. So that's the big plus. But there's so much broken line in the water um, that that's the next thing. Now, when we, I talked about the passive acoustics that we have in the sanctuary that's recording sounds, well, we have those sitting on the bottom, and then we trip them with an acoustic link that brings them to the surface, mm -hmm. and we can retrieve them. Well, you can do that with fishing gear, too. Um, but it's expensive. You know, right now, the lobsters are fishing the very best way they can. And I really like lobster fishing. I mean, it's a great fisher because it's incredibly efficient. What a stupid way to catch lobsters, right? I mean, you should catch them with a big net and just pull them on the bottom and catch every lobster that's there. Of course, then there'd be no more lobsters. So the fact that lobster fishing is so incredibly efficient means that there's still lobster there and it can employ lots and lots of other cool people, lots and lots of small towns, right? So I really like lobster fishing. Um, but um, it's not stupid, they're not, not getting rich. And some of these technologies, um, you know, are like, it would cost $100,000 or more to re outfit some of these here to have these acoustic mics. So that's, you know, that's where the government should come in, right? The Endangered Species Act is a government rule. So why should the government come and help people that need help to, to save a critically endangered species? I don't understand. I keep waiting for Eli Musler or um, somebody to come and go, wow, you can save lobster fishing and you can save right whales at the same time. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? You know, Bill Gates, where are you? You know, but I don't have contact with either of those guys for some reason. Lobsters will be moving north. Yeah. The, the entanglement issue off of Long Island is nowhere as near as it used to be. And that's because the fishery isn't there much anymore. So, you know, I guess if you wait now, the problem is right well to be extinct probably in 50 to 100 years. Um, so that's probably the amount of time it's going to have for fishing gear to get out of Massachusetts and Maine. And uh, Ray Seals and Ray Chester. So, you can all set swimming again. We've been, we've been hearing so much about the changes in the currents and ocean circulation. Um, in your story, the, that doesn't enter in, or, or do the current, the changing currents affect your populations? I, I'm sure that I don't know anything about it. 
you get not, not to research what I do. Um, I read about it, um, but that's as close as I come. It seems pretty worrisome, but I really don't know. All right, well, thank you, everyone. local food. We have some beer and wine that are serving us. We welcome you to stay. Our um, team will be around these different titles for the local chicken challenge. If you have it, there's some uh, poster boards. Check them out and, um, and thank you. Thanks for coming.